Great. Shall we? Uh, shall we get going then? Yeah. Good idea. Hand over to you. Okie dokie. Um, hello and a very warm welcome to this evening's guest lecture with Professor James E. Young. This event is hosted by the British Association for Holocaust Studies um, by myself, Elizabeth Kendrick and Hannah Wilson. We are both PhD students in Holocaust memory at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. We'd also like to give a huge thanks to our friends Daniela Ozaki and Boaz Cohen from the Holocaust Studies Programme at Western Galilee College for granting us use of their Zoom platform so that we can allow so many people to attend this evening. So just to begin, um, I've got a couple of housekeeping points I'd just like to run through. So first of all, if you can please all ensure that your microphones are muted during the presentation, just so we don't have any unnecessary interruptions, that would be fantastic. Um, so the way it will work is Professor Young will give his presentation. Um, we will then follow this by a question and answer panel. Um, so we do anticipate that we may not have time to answer all of the questions that are posed. But I would like to encourage you all to type them into the chat box function and then what we will do is we will go through and select some questions to pose to Professor Young. Um, so we do ask then that if you can just keep your questions um, relatively short just so we can get through as many as possible. Thank you. Over to you Hannah. So with that I'd like to introduce Professor Young. Um, I think the fact that so many people are here watching um, is testament to the impact that his work has had um, for researchers in the field of Holocaust memory, commemoration and the wider aspects of dealing with difficult heritage, you'll have no doubt come across Professor Young's work as a basis for the critical debates and issues surrounding these topics. So James E. Young is Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of English and Judaic and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he was founding director for the Institute of Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies. His groundbreaking publications, The Texture of Memory in 1993, At Memory's Edge in 2000, and The Stages of Memory in 2016, continue to be some of the most important works in this field. In this slide lecture, Professor Young will trace what he calls the memorial's arc, from May Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, to German Holocaust Memorials, to the National September 11th Memorial in New York City. Professor Young served on the design juries for both Berlin's Memorial, Memorial for Europeans Murdered Jews and for the 9-11 Memorial Competition. He will discuss these processes from his perspective as a juror. So Professor Young, with great pleasure, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would um, <clears throat> try to cover some of the background that led me to uh, see this arc in what I've come to call a memorial vernacular from World War I uh, memorialization to the, uh, World War II and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC, to the Denk Mall, and even then back to the 9-11 uh, Memorial in New York City. Um, the last two processes I know very well from uh, having juried them, as Hannah mentioned. Um, as I, uh, I kind of begin the book the same way, but it's, it's, I think it's worth, you know, repeating that uh, we actually unveiled the winning design uh, of the September 11, uh, National September 11 Memorial in January 2004, after nine months of intense deliberation. Uh, we were part, I was part of a jury of 13 people, uh, which included Maya Lin, in fact, on the jury. Um, uh, a member of the a victim's family and other kind of arts professionals from New York City. And as we were, you know, kind of uh, explaining our winning design, <clears throat> you know, Michael Arad and Peter Walker's um, uh, amazing two voids in the footprints of the World Trade Center towers, uh, each void punctuated by a further void at its center, you know, waterfalls streaming down about from 35 feet, down 35 feet, and then again, all the way down to bedrock. Um, the plaza filled in by uh, white swamp oak trees, several hundred of them. Um, and, you know, realizing that the larger they grew, uh, the deeper the volumes of the voids would become. And we just loved the way that uh, 
loss was being commemorated by loss here and by voids, like the, the void of the, of the dead at ground zero at Washington DC in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Uh, and that the plazas uh, would be uh, full of regenerating uh, life and trees. So we're remembering life with life and loss with loss. And this became our, our theme as we presented um, the design that day. And uh, we, were, uh, we had looked at 5,201 designs um, from 62 countries over the course of this nine months and settled on this design. And, and I'll show you some of the others in this, in this talk. And of course, I'm happy to uh, entertain questions about any and all of these um, you know, at the end. Um, but the very first question uh, I got uh, after we announced the design, <clears throat> um, and this was after uh, we were now permitted to speak to the press, uh, we were uh, not permitted to speak to the press during this whole you know, time, um, was uh, from uh, a reporter who knew my work pretty well and had known, followed the process pretty closely and said, so <clears throat> let me get this straight. You've worked with you know, Daniel Liebeskind on his Jewish Museum in Berlin, um, uh, uh, Peter Eisenman um, of the same kind of deconstructivist school of architecture, uh, is somebody you wrote about at length uh, on the Denkmal and you were on the jury that, uh, that uh, chose the Peter Eisenman design uh, for Berlin. And you've kind of coined this notion of the, the counter monument and negative form monuments. <clears throat> And now you've chosen two gigantic voids in the footprints of the World Trade Center uh, you know, site uh, as your design for the National September 11 Memorial. Um, hasn't your jury basically just chosen another Holocaust monument for this design? And at first I was a little bit offended, <clears throat> but then the more I began to think of it, I, my mind began to race you know, for an answer. And I, I realized uh, that in fact, um, you know, the reporter had a had a point. This wasn't actually a, a Holocaust memorial, but all of architectural and memorial uh, vernacular had been inflected by the Holocaust, especially the preoccupation with um, with loss and the inability to uh, kind of fill the void in, <clears throat> uh, you know, without giving it you know meaning and without redeeming you know this terrible loss. What are you charging that for? <laughs> so, um, so I went on and then I began thinking of um, uh, a dinner I'd had with Maya Lin in 1988, fairly early, uh, just about six years after the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, was in fact unveiled. And she had told me um, that in fact her own design of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial um, had owed a debt to both the World War I Memorial uh, by Edwin Lutens, uh, the Memorial to the Battle of the Somme, or the missing of the Battle of the Somme, and to the Memorial on the Ile de la Cité uh, in Paris, France, uh, the Memorial to the Deporté. So here I'm going to take you to that memorial. <clears throat> And she said that, well, during her junior year at Yale uh, in the, at the School of Architecture, which she spent in Paris, um, she was struck by this fairly early you know, Holocaust memorial, you know, the memorial to the deported Jews of, of uh, France. And um, here she was struck by its horizontality, the way that it was built into the ground as kind of a negative form monument. Um, there was a motif of triangles she loved the way that it made you descend into the ground somehow, um, now occluding the sky, um, the sound, city sounds around you, only the, the you know, kind of the, the steeple of the uh, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral uh, there in the background. And everything was now quiet. <clears throat> that basically um, the architect Henri Pangouchon had carved a, a space in the ground that, um, my Lynn hoped uh, would kind of carve a space within us, open up a space within us for memory. The only way out 
uh, the only kind of view out of this you know triangular motif was this grilled window looking out on the river Seine. And what was so fascinating here is that if you look across, if you're across the river looking at this memorial, um, you see kind of the prow of a ship like this, you know, kind of jutting into the river Seine. But if you're inside, you realize that you're inside of this, um, uh, this, this negative space, you know, triangular negative space. And when Maya Lin designed her, um, her, her submission for the international and blind competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial um, in 1980. Uh, this is what she proposed. <clears throat> this, this pastel is kind of gorgeous. It took a while for the, uh, the jurors to really catch on to what she was doing, but it was a blind competition completely. And it was quite clear <clears throat> that she had now taken um, this kind of this notion of carving something out of the ground and leaving that uh, to stand that the that the negative space the void now would become a memorial setting that instead of taking um the the, the very most kind of militaristic and aggressive of architectural forms you know the flying wedge uh the the tip of the spear you know the point of an arrow you know this jutting elbow she she instead took that jutting elbow and opened it up into a Crux, the crux of the arm, almost like an embrace, in which she would now invite visitors to come uh, remember in this space. Uh, one axis pointed to the Washington Monument, the other axis pointed to the Lincoln Memorial. The um, only forms in this memorial, the only uh, figures are the reflections of ourselves, the visitors. Um, there's nothing monumental um, about these forms. They are, in fact, humanly scaled because they are, they are our reflections here. Um, she said that this memorial would be distinguished from what she called the fixed, the fixed kind of monument. <clears throat> and that instead it would invite people to uh, enter and then exit. Um, it would become kind of a, a mobile memory, memory by, me, by means of perambulation, and thereby an animated memorial and not a fixed monument, in her words. And this became very important uh, for people thinking about uh, memorials afterwards. She really did kind of break the mold uh, in many ways. And I'm constantly asked, well, <clears throat> did she have influence then over kind of the generation of um, German memorial designers? Um, and in fact, uh, she did, you know, this would have been, this was dedicated in 1982. Um, she really wanted to counterpoint uh, all the traditional, um, uh, conventional uh, kinds of memorial vernacular. Uh, she wanted something that would not overwhelm us, but something that would be humanly proportioned, something that would reflect back to us our own preoccupations and even our own faces. Uh, the names would be carved in the memorial, not in alphabetical order, um, but in the order in which the uh, soldiers fell uh, in battle in Vietnam, um, basically re-embedding this memorial uh, in history itself. And um, <clears throat> she hoped that the kind of the, um, in this kind of the capital of white neoclassic uh, monoliths, um, that this, in fact, would be a distinct counterpoint to those and would be very much cut into the ground as a wound, a wound that would never heal, in her words. Um, and then almost like um, taking a, a slice of a geode, opening that up, and then polishing those edges. And this would be a, a place that, where the wound would stay, an open wound, uh, would be the place that invites us into it, um, a place that would open up a uh, space in the landscape, which would open up the space in us uh, for memory. And this was, in fact, a great inspiration uh, for German, uh, a generation of German memorial artists who were now just as preoccupied with how to articulate their very ambivalent memory uh, about World War II and the Holocaust, how to uh, remember a people uh, without somehow filling the, the void left behind in, um, how to remember that void and define it at the same time. 
And this led to a design proposed by Horst Holheisel in the 1995 competition for the DECMA. Uh, that would be the earlier uh, competition, which was uh, later voided uh, by the chancellor. But in this uh, design, Horst Holheisel proposed taking the Brandenburger Tor, Germany's national monument, and blowing it up <clears throat> and then spreading the dust and the, and the pieces out in front uh, of the whole area of the memorial. Um, the area will be covered with granite plates, he says, as you see here, <clears throat> as the memorial, two blank voids you know, are created. <clears throat> you know, it's double voids, and this is the actual memorial. Um, you know, how better to remember the destroyed Jews of Europe than by destroying the national monument? And by questioning the capacity of any monument to remember or domesticate or somehow articulate um, this vast destruction you know, without redeeming it. So this generation of German artists was, was intent on trying to commemorate the Holocaust, but not redeem or valorize it in, in any possible way. Kind of with this in mind, um, uh, Jochen Gertz and Esther Schellev Gertz, um, a couple, uh, then living in, in Paris, Jochen had actually been born in Berlin during the war, uh, proposed a memorial in, in Harburg, uh, which was supposed to be sited um, in the botanical gardens near Damtor, um, but was eventually moved out to Harburg, an immigrant community across the river. Um, they proposed this 12 meter tall lead column, <clears throat> um, which would invite the citizens of the neighborhood Harburg and visitors to the town to add their names here to ours. In so doing, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant. As more and more names cover this 12 meter tall lead column, it will gradually be lowered into the ground. One day it will have disappeared completely and the site of the Harburg Monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. And of course here, they make very clear that um, we can't allow these memorials to rem remember for us and they can't re and we can't allow them to substitute themselves for the actions we need to take on their behalf. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. So by getting rid of this memorial, that is inviting people to inscribe their names, even swastikas began to appear, scribble scrabble. The graffiti you know, was uh, disturbed you know, the town officials greatly. They wanted to get rid of it. And the artist simply replied, you are getting rid of it. But as it shrunk between 1986 on its dedication and 1993 on its last sinking, it became very clear that it was going to return the burden of memory to those who came looking for it. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. Um, Jochen Gertz and Esther Shalev Gertz were intent on making clear that we were to be inspired to action by these memorials and not allow these memorials to become a vicarious or substitute action not even to allow memory to become kind of a, a, a vicarious action, that without action inspired by these memorials, um, these memorials were basically useless. Uh, both the Gerzes and uh, Horst Hoheisel were also clear that in fact, they took great inspiration uh, from, from Maya Lin, a way to challenge uh, uh, both memorial culture, German memorial culture in particular, um, especially the, the fetishization um, of monuments uh, by authoritarian, fascist, and, uh, and Soviet era uh, uh, kind of uh, fetishization of the monumental. And uh, a couple of years later, 1991, <clears throat> uh, Jochen Gerritz taught a class in Saarbrücken at the Institute, Art Institute, and invited his class on monuments <clears throat> um, to take a vow of secrecy he would send half the class out to steal cobblestones from the rest of the town and, <clears throat> and then come back and replace these cobblestones that they had stolen, <clears throat> um, taking, them, taking these up to the classroom, putting the cobblestones from around town in their places. And then the other half of the class would research every last uh, Jewish cemetery destroyed by the Nazis between 1933 and 1945 of some 2,162 of them. They took these inscribed cobblestones back to this plaza and then embedded them without telling anybody. But of course, they, this being a, a Jochen Gerst production, they embedded them inscribed side down. 
so there's no sign of what they had done. Uh, the point being, it would now become what they called the Plaza of the Invisible Monument. Um, and as people came down to see what had happened, the students stood around um, and uh, just said simply that uh, uh, you have become the monuments for which you search here. Look within yourselves to the memory you hope to find here. And again, this, this way to return to return memory you know, from the obelisk or the stone back to the people who come looking for it, you know, to make very clear that monuments actually don't remember anything. Um, they only remember in the company who come to protect the memories onto them. In 1986, at the same time the, uh, the Garrisons were doing their sinking monument, uh, Horace Hill proposed this memorial costume to commemorate uh, what was called then the Ashrud Brunnen, the Ashrud Fountain, which had been destroyed uh, by the Nazis in 1938. This was a gift from Anglo the town of Kassel. Um, the town of Kassel now wanted to replace it <clears throat> or to commemorate it in some way. Horst Hoheisel proposed taking the original design of this neo Gothic pyramid and inverting it, turning it upside down. In Again, creating this negative form to counterpoint um, kind of the, the, what the traditional monument would be. To be very clear, merely reproducing it, um, you don't actually compensate the loss that it's meant to commemorate. Uh, the Castle's Jews, um, uh, most of whom had been sent to Riga, uh, where they were murdered in the forest there. Uh, Horst's father had been the forest master <clears throat> in the Nazi party, um, uh, was based in Riga. Uh, this is all quite personal for Horst Hoheisel, who actually had a, has a degree, a PhD in forestry. And this is one of his very first memorial uh, submissions. He's become, I think, you know, Germany's leading memorialist uh, since then. So sure enough, uh, he won this competition with this and the only standing vertical forms uh, in this little plaza right in front of the, um, the Rathaus or the uh, town hall are the people who come looking for a memory. And about every hour or so, this little channel fills with water and flows down instead of spritzing up the way that the original uh, memorial, the, the original fountain, you know, did in its day. And thereby, you know, counterpointing memorials. At one point, he even said that uh, he didn't want anything on top except the people. That this was meant to become kind of a plinth um, to accommodate rememberers, and the rememberers thereby become uh, the memorial doing this exactly the same time that Jochen and Esther uh, Gerts uh, were doing this uh, in, in Hamburg. Um, they didn't know each other at that point. They didn't know um, of each other's projects, but both of them doing this in that, in that moment, very much um, uh, a response to an extension of Maya Lin's uh, counter, counter monument um, designs in, in Washington, DC, I think. Remember, this is all going through my head as I'm trying to, you know, find this answer, you know, to the reporter, and that's kind of where this, uh, even the the slideshow comes from, because it, I have kind of a slideshow in my head as I'm trying to answer uh, to suggest that, you know, not every new memorial is going to be a, a Holocaust memorial or even look like a Holocaust memorial, but most all memorials now will be indebted to um, this new preoccupation with absence and loss and, uh, and the capacity for memorials to leave these intact, these absences and losses intact rather than filling them in. Um, this takes me to Babelplatz uh, where the Berlin government uh, had a competition for a memorial to the uh, book burnings 19, of March, 1933. And then Michel Ullmann, the Israeli artist who was living for a time in Germany uh, proposed what he called Bibliothèque um, here in the in the in the Babel Plots, you know, right across the street from the Opera and the, um, the Humboldt University, he proposed uh, putting uh, two steel plaques, one on this left side, one on the right, where you can see the people standing, uh, describing the book burnings, um, and then the other one uh, simply quoting Heinrich Heine's prescient words, uh, where books are burned, so too one day will people be burned as well, and then. In the middle, uh, putting a window into uh, looking into a room, what he called the bibliothèque below. So again, the only standing forms 
you know, in this square are the people standing above that window and looking down into it. And this is what they see, uh, a room full of empty, empty bookshelves. Uh, the burned books uh, can never be replaced. Uh, obviously, the author's lives uh, can never be replaced or compensated. Absence will be remembered by absence, loss by loss. And this is the, um, you know, this is kind of the, uh, what, what you see looking down, the sky reflected, the heavens reflected, the clouds reflected um, in this uh, window covering uh, a library room with empty bookshelves. So once again, this motif of loss and absence gets you know, picked up over and over again. Rachel Whiteread, <clears throat> great uh, British uh, sculptor, won the 1984 Turner uh, Prize. Uh, for her uh, empty, or for her row house that she filled with uh, concrete to articulate the, the space within the row house when all the all the, the siding and the and uh, the material was taken away, won a competition for Vienna's uh, Judenplatz Memorial uh, to Austria's murdered Jews, uh, with what she also called a bibliothèque or library, but in this case the library um, form it's almost a cenotaph like. Uh, consists of what she calls the space between the leaves of the book and the walls of the library. So it's like taking that inner space and turning it inside out, materializing it. <clears throat> um, her, her famous uh, axiom, which she wanted to use material as an index of absence, hence the filled in uh, filled in bathtubs, the spaces between cha uh, beneath chairs. Uh, always looking for this, how to articulate that absence seal without filling it in somehow. And uh, Bibliotech, of course, would commemorate um, the people of the book by a, a, a bookish motif here as well. There's, a, um, there's much more story uh, to this particular more memorial and where it stands in the Judenplatz, um, which I, I write about uh, in, um, uh, at Memory's Edge. Um, so that's it's something to pursue here, uh, but the memorial, in fact, was built. Uh, at first, local townspeople uh, didn't like it. They didn't like calling this kind of attention to the, you know, to the neighborhood. Uh, but what they found when they began excavating for the memorial was, of course, uh, the reason this is called Judenplatz. This had been the site of a um, an auto de fe uh, where the local Jews have been burned alive in their synagogue, you know, in the, in the 16th century. Um, commemorated at this point only by a tapestry in a church nearby that said um, that this, on this site in 1526 is where the Hebrew dogs were punished for their horrible crimes. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Simon Ati, an American artist, moved to Berlin in 1990, just after the wall came down, and was struck by what he didn't see, uh, which were any commemorations or any uh, any uh, traces of the Jews who once lived in this neighborhood in, in the you know, so-called so uh, Schweinefeldel, uh, the barn district. So he researched uh, hundreds and hundreds of photographs taken in the 20s and 30s of this neighborhood, which had housed mostly uh, displaced Jews from uh, Poland, uh, Ostjuden, who had come here without papers, uh, living in this neighborhood, <clears throat> and basically imposed, uh, took these images, turned them into slides, and then projected them back onto the very sites where they had originally been taken uh, in the 20s and 30s. This would have been an image of a, of a Hebrew bookseller, <clears throat> Again, a Hebrew book bookstore, <clears throat> and there's something very uncanny about the way that um, it becomes a bit of a palimpsest. It's almost like you could peel off, you know, the, <clears throat> the the cover of what's here and look at what was once underneath. Uh, but clearly, it's always going to be the projection of the artist's eye, the projection of the visitor's eye, back onto these sites, um, thereby animating these sites <clears throat> with our memory of what had once been there. The Jewish bakery, the Konditorei, Jewish theater. And again, this, this preoccupation with what is not there, what does not meet the eye, how to animate it, 
and then how to um, how to make these images now live in the mind's eye so that once he turned these slides off, uh, anybody who had seen this would carry this around with them in their head. <clears throat> so the early competition, the 1995 competition uh, for Berlin Steg Mall was in fact voided um, by Helmut Kohl, um, as I mentioned. Uh, the winning design <clears throat> uh, was it was pretty bad. Christina Jakob Marx, a, a Berlin-based artist, had proposed a 100 meter square slab of concrete tilted from one meter high on one part to um, 11 meters high on the other, uh, covered with 4.2 million names of Jewish victims. <clears throat> um, why 4.2 million? Because she said that the, the, that was just the number that could be recovered. And uh, then scattered with 18 boulders imported from Masada in Israel, uh, the site of um, Jewish zealots mass suicide uh, in the face of being taken as slaves uh, by Roman conquerors in 77 uh, in the Common Era. Uh, none of which worked. Um, uh, you, everybody agreed it was a horrible design. It had been chosen by a committee composed of the uh, so-called Citizens Committee or Forderkreis, uh, the Berlin Senate, <clears throat> and, and the German uh, Bundestag, five members each. And th that's what they came up with. It was thrown over um, between 1995 and 1997. There was just this internal uh, kind of self-flagellating uh, debate <clears throat> on how could we be, you know, how could Germany be so good at you know, destroying the Jews of Europe and so bad at how to commemorate them. Um, it went on and on around in circles. Um, I was at that point not even really for a central mo memorial. Um, I worried that it would take the place of all the dozens of pretty great memorials and, and uh, education centers uh, that they already had in Germany, the sites of various concentration camps and, and reconstructed synagogues. Um, but in the end, I was invited along with several others to give uh, these keynote speeches at a series of symposia, uh, which I did in uh, April 1997. And uh, basically, I uh, wanted to kind of put the German search for a national memorial to the Holocaust in context. And so I told the stories of how other memorials um, uh, in other countries, uh, American memorials, Polish memorials, and Israeli memorials, um, were also surrounded and, and kind of drenched in their own fraught debates <clears throat> and how each of these national memorials would necessarily reflect their own national experiences uh, of memory. And that the Germans were trying to do something that nobody else was, you know, had ever tried to do before. You know, how to uh, commemorate you know, the, the national shame or the national crime how to um, rebuild Berlin, reunite Berlin on the bedrock memory of its national crime, how to commemorate a people murdered in the national name. Um, and here I said, uh, where, for example, in Washington, DC, is there even one little pebble to commemorate the slave auctions that were held there you know, for, for 100 years? Um, there's no memorial in the States to commemorate slavery, America's own you know, national or racial sin. Um, you're trying to do something that nobody's really done before. And as it turns out, um, in this country, the United States had a lot to learn uh, from how the Germans were conducting you know, their search and the kinds of debates they went through. And eventually I said that um, maybe it's better, in fact, that you don't settle on any single memorial design, but that you just have a, uh, a thousand years of memorial competitions. <clears throat> Um, and so, you know, that there may be no uh, final solution to your national memorial debate. And they got that. Um, and within a couple of days, I got a phone call after returning to the States asking if I would uh, be one of a five member Findor's Commission for uh, a, new, uh, a new competition for a national memorial, a Dijk Mall in Berlin. And I said, well, it's funny you ask me because I'm not sure it can be done or that it even should be done. <clears throat> and I said, if you allow us as a jury to describe um, a process that doesn't propose an answer 
to Germany's memorial conundrum, but proposes um, a way to articulate the question, then maybe you know I I, I would participate. <clears throat> and so I was appointed as one of five. We were allowed to invite 25 artists, um, including nine from the original competition, to a new competition. And we ended up with three finalists. Uh, this uh, going on in the November 1997 <clears throat> and going on into 1998. Uh, this was our, you know, kind of the, the third one by Daniel Liebeskind, number three, um, what he called Stone Breath, uh, a, a broken segment of wall. What we liked was what he did with the um, the site of the memorial, which he let it run over into the tear garden <clears throat> with the square on the left, uh, the, the point square on the left going to the Goethe uh, uh, bust. Um, you can see the, um, you know, the Reichstag behind, you can see the Brandenburger tour nearby, and this picture would be almost from the uh, post on the plots. But we didn't like the idea of one architect, Daniel Liebeskind, you know, kind of being responsible now for both the National Memorial and the Jewish Museum, uh, which had already opened. This was very much an extension of the voids now articulated by these, uh, the voids of the Jewish Museum now articulated by these pieces of wall. So our first two choices uh, included this one by Gesina Weimiller, uh, which we liked very much. And here, uh, you can see that there is certainly a debt to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It is a negative form. It's cut into the ground. As you descend into the space, the city itself would kind of disappear. She took 18 segments <coughs> of limestone, uh, lines, limestone blocks, uh, turning them into short segments of walls, 18 to correspond to Hebrew gematria for high uh, life and arranged seemingly randomly. But in fact, as we walked uh, along the model to the, uh, along the parapet here to the far right corner, uh, we could see that these in fact began to compose themselves as a, a Jewish star, a star of David. And then as we continued walking along the other side, the, the star would decompose. Um, a little bit of a visual uh, trick, um, but she hadn't prepared us for it. So we, we kind of discovered it on our own. But we worried a little bit that it might you know, turn into a, somewhat of a gimmick. <clears throat> but again, we, we liked it in its simplicity and its minimalism. Uh, we liked the way it extended uh, some of the ideas that Maya Lin uh, had taken to Washington, DC. It would be memory by means of perambulation, everybody finding their own way through and their own way out. But in the end, we chose this design by <clears throat> Peter Eisenman <clears throat> and Richard Serra. Uh, Eisenman, the American architect, uh, Sarah, uh, American sculptor of gigantic uh, Corten uh, steel forms. <clears throat> they proposed uh, 4,200 stelle over this 20,000 square meter or five acre site, um, ranging from ground level to some uh, uh, seven or uh, eight or even 10 meters tall. Uh, they would seem to wave as a field of wheat, um, thereby being you know, animated. Uh, each one of these stele would be three degrees off plumb uh, to give you the sense, again, of animation. Um, everybody would have to find their own way in and their own way out, <clears throat> which we uh, began to worry would be very difficult in such a huge field that um, in fact, it would become a, a dangerous place. People would go in and maybe never find their way out. Um, we asked the artist to come in and we proposed uh, a few changes, including scaling it down, uh, making the stella uh, smaller. Eisenman was glad to do this. Um, but, uh, Richard Sarah said, well, if the scale down is actually no longer anything to do with me. Uh, my forms are meant to be dangerous. <clears throat> they're meant to be ominous. They're meant to be threatening. And he said that uh, some of my forms um, even tip over, you know, these Corten steel ellipses tip over um, when during installation, you know, killing your workers, putting them in, as if that were supposed to reassure us. And Eisenman <clears throat> responded simply by proposing a, a new design. This is the space it was going to take. Many people, you know, actually in Berlin said, so why don't you just keep the space open and let that be the memorial. 
this is the space in relation to the Berlin Wall, you know, which had now been down <clears throat> for several years, but it was really a kind of a no man's land. And um, Hitler's bunker, in fact, uh, is right there at the tip of the uh, flag. Uh, the East German flag. <clears throat> so you can see this right in the shadow of the um, um, of the Brandenburger Tor, uh, or, you know, uh, a, a rock's throw from the uh, the bunker itself. Eisenman's new design uh, was 2,711 Stelle, scaled down to about uh, eight or nine feet tall, you know, roughly uh, two or three meters. And uh, now surrounded by linden trees uh, all around the edges to buffer the edges a little bit and soften them and to uh, create spaces also for, for commemoration. And this we liked very much. Um, but at this point, Sarah uh, left the project, uh, saying it's no longer you know, anything you do with me. Eisenman took it over. <clears throat> and this became the final design, but they called the Eisenman II design, you know, which was in fact built, to, um, eventually built, dedicated in May 2005. Visiting it under construction, it became very clear that in fact, in its underdetermined forms, there would be no writing on any of these. Everybody really was going to find their own way in, their own way out. You would be remembering separately <clears throat> and together. You know, barely room, in fact. You know, for two people to go in or, in or out. Um, completely abstract. <clears throat> During the discussions <clears throat> and uh, during the debates in Parliament as to whether to go forward um, in 1998, we proposed the Parliament vote on this memorial in three parts. Uh, uh, first, do you want a central Denkmal for Europe's murdered Jews in the center of Berlin uh, in this site? <clears throat> second, do you want the Peter Eisenman design number two? Uh, which we hereby have found for you, um, and we submit this design. And third, uh, do you want a place of information to be built underneath? This became um, a really important part of the design, in fact. Um, much more important um, in retrospect than, than we even thought at the time. And so Parliament did vote on these three. And the fourth question was, of course, whether to establish a foundation, a Stiftung, to support this memorial in perpetuity. And in fact, Parliament did vote uh, on all of these things, <clears throat> um, approved it, and it went under construction at this point. But I'd like to point out something that you know, they did here, which in fact, uh, we took great inspiration from uh, in New York. <clears throat> um, again, Every memorial built owes a debt to something that, you know, that came before. Um, Dagmar von Wilken, the uh, designer of the space below, the place of information below, which I believe is Europe's you know, greatest Holocaust uh, museum uh, in its simplicity, in its very direct line, in its very powerful uh, narrative. Von Wilken proposed <clears throat> um, creating the illusion that the Stelle would penetrate into the space below. Um, the ex exhibition design <clears throat> and uh, narrative would actually be you know, kind of emblazoned on these to create the sense, well, you know, really an illusion because these aren't the actual Stelle, but by allowing the appearance of the Stelle to to penetrate or seem to penetrate below, you would create this yin and yang of abstract memorial design above coming in and being um, uh, finding its foundation in the hard historical narrative below. So what would be an abstract design above now finds its anchor <clears throat> in very um, hard narrative of the Holocaust below it. 
And we ended up taking that cue um, and creating the memorial in New York City, the 9-11 memorial, and building the museum underneath so that these two abstract designs, these two abstract voids above, are also anchored in a very hard historic history of the day. Just as we were worried about kids running out over the tops of these, of course, and breaking their necks when they were tall, this is exactly what the kids do. You know, today. <clears throat> so as we continue this, so, <clears throat> so here we go to nineteen ninety eight, and one of the um, really interesting parts of the memorial again that I want to. Uh, So uh, can you see this or not? Hello? No, 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 we okay, can't sorry. see. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> So you can see this now? Yeah, we can see it now, James. Thank you. <clears throat> so to reflect for a minute, um, <clears throat> when the uh, parliament was voting <clears throat> uh, whether to approve the Eisenman design and to go ahead and build the National Dyke Mall for Europe's murder Jews, uh, this was right in the middle of debates as to whether to allow uh, the German Air Force to join NATO <clears throat> in going after the Serbs to save the coast of our Albanians. <clears throat> uh, President Clinton had tried to put together a coalition um, to stop what he saw as a certain uh, new genocide of coast of our Albanians by the Serbs. Um, uh, this is now in 1999. And for the very first time, Germany allowed its air force uh, to join NATO forces and to leave its borders <clears throat> and to bomb uh, Belgrade and, and Serb, Serb forces as part of the NATO coalition. Um, <clears throat> Joschka Fischer um, had agreed to join the, uh, the coalition <clears throat> with Gerhard Schroeder, uh, only on condition that the memorial be built on the one hand. And then <clears throat> he said, but that's not enough uh, building a memorial is not enough. We must act on this memory. And insofar as this memorial will serve to inspire us to prevent and intervene in a new genocide, um, this is how we will now act. And so he invoked the Holocaust Memorial in their decision to allow German, German planes to intervene for the very first time. So this is part of this context uh, that's really important you know, to keep in mind. Um, remember the Gertz, the Gertz's you know, notion that it is we ourselves who must rise up against injustice. Our memorials don't rise up, we rise up. And uh, Joschka Fischer invoked exactly that connection uh, before going to war against Serbia <clears throat> and uh, a war which was successful in fact in rolling back Serb forces and saving the uh, coast of our Albanians. So this, that was 1999, two years later, uh, September 11th, 2001, came the infamous attacks. Um, within days of the attacks, uh, for whatever reason, so remember um, at Memory's Edge, it come out in 2000 um, with a long description of the deck mall process. Um, I curated an exhibition uh, in New York and Berlin called The Art of Memory in 1994. And um, within a few days of the attacks, I had uh, 
calls from the mayor's office and governor's office to come and um, sit down and try to figure out how to commemorate these September 11th attacks, which is kind of crazy because this was kind of ongoing. And so I did come into back into town where I had lived for 22 years and uh, met with officials and tried to reframe the process for them as um, they said, so what's the monument going to be or what's the memorial going to be? And I want to say, I said, why don't you break it down? Um, this kind of is still history unfolding. It's not memory yet. It's what we see, you know, in the faces of people who are watching this is what is being reported, you know, by local residents. Why don't you allow the memorial <clears throat> to begin with the first reports, continue with the candlelight vigils, <clears throat> think of the memorial as, as something in its long durée. Think of it as the stages of memory, hence you know, the, the title of my book and the title of the chapter on the 9-11 memorial. Let the memorial include these candlelight vigils from the evening of September 11th, spontaneous. Nobody told these people to show up. They all just knew what to do. They will remember according to their, their traditions, memorial conventions, candlelight, of course, uh, not just yard site candles, but, you know, uh, something that kind of epitomizes the eph ephemerality uh, of life, the, the, the flickering animation of life, so easily extinguished, warmth, light to keep back the darkness. So why don't you include the flyers, thousands of flyers posted all over uh, New York City, uh, Manhattan and all the boroughs um, of, the, of the victims? by their families. And of course, this reminded everybody that even though we didn't have any solid meaning for this memory yet, the families certainly had meaning. They had experienced direct loss of their loved ones. These are the loved ones who didn't come home that night. And that motif was established <clears throat> as missing and lost. Nobody went searching for a memorial motif here. Uh, nobody you know, was already preoccupied by loss and absence, but the families themselves now defined how, this, how these victims were going to be commemorated by these flyers, missing, thousands of them all over. I go, these are almost like um, um, you know, tombstone um, epitaphs. Have you seen my sister? <clears throat> Have you seen my daughter? Have you seen my brother, my father? missing, who they are, what they look like, where they worked, what their families, uh, you know, their, their children's names are, very much like, uh, like, like, like paper uh, tombstones. Think of the memorial to include all the vigils from across the river, from across the harbor here. And of course, the absence of the towers was striking to all New Yorkers. <clears throat> And at first there was even a conflation between the towers and the lives lost in the towers. The towers are gone and so, and so are the lives. And so in some ways the towers began to stand for them until the victims' families you know, began to call out and they said, no, let's remember the, the, the people in the towers, not the towers themselves. The firefighters' families, you know, nearly 400 firefighters who died when the towers came down, they certainly knew who they had lost, what they had lost. And they also understood something <clears throat> that other victims' families didn't, that you know, they, weren't, they just didn't happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong moment. They went down there as part of their civic <clears throat> uh, responsibility and duty. In some cases, walking the last two or three miles to the sites with 100 pounds of equipment and hoses on their backs, then climbing 86 floors of the towers to save people when they came down. And they were already asking some of us now, you know, involved, how they would be remembered differently. <clears throat> and that became a, an issue. Do we create a hierarchy of victims for first responders? Uh, or do we remember them all equally? And we end up answering this, as you'll see later on. 
many people wanted to remember uh, what happened by preserving the destruction itself. And many of us involved argued strenuously against that, arguing that to preserve the memory of the lives lost in the detritus of the destruction itself would be to remember destruction with destruction, um, exactly the ways that the bombers themselves would have commemorated their great deed, their horrible deed. <clears throat> Some people said, why don't you just leave the, 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 the remnant of the facade, the tritons <clears throat> standing as a, as a memorial? And I said, my, my answer was always, let all of this be commemorated. In these photographs, let the cleanup operations, the rescue operations, the recovery operations, all of these are part of the stages of memory. This uh, steel cross of the beams just accidentally saved this way, being you know, saluted in some ways uh, while victims would be found by the firefighters, seemed to the firefighters families to be a great natural memorial. In fact, it was removed from the site and is going to be returned to the site uh, sometime next year to the perimeter. <clears throat> Again, as a, as a ruin. On the six month anniversary uh, of the attacks in March, March 11th, uh, 2002, uh, these tribute and light beams were shined from the site these were originally conceived as uh, birthday candles uh, for the 30th uh, birthday of the World Trade Center towers. They didn't, they didn't quite get there. And so now they became the memorial candles. Uh, um, so beautiful and so powerful. You can see these from 50 or 60 miles away uh, that we as a jury eventually for the memorial uh, asked that these be shown on September 11th, every year, as part of whatever memorial was finally chosen. Again, the ephemerality, um, the, the way to see them from, uh, from far and wide, and their sheer beauty, uh, we liked very much. On the first anniversary, the family simply gathered and read the names of their lost loved ones one at a time. This is put together now by uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who had become the mayor. You remember the primary was actually held September 11th. And those elections were put off. Uh, mayor Bloomberg was eventually elected in later elections. And it was his office who began organizing both the cleanup and the uh, memorial uh, anniversary uh, commemorations uh, on September 11, 2002. And by then, um, I had been asked you know, to kind of join the memorial process. And I joined the families and I took these pictures um, you know, downtown. Within one year, the entire site had been cleaned up. And this too became part of the stages of memory. Uh, a little reflecting, two little reflecting pools like this were built. And as the Families of victims read their lost loved ones' names. Uh, they took flowers down this huge ramp and laid them in the little ponds, the little reflecting ponds. So in a way, a tradition was already established. Um, again, quite, quite minimalist, uh, only the families involved. These, these weren't public, huge public commemorations. And it was thus, really, for the first nine years um, after But by August 2002, <clears throat> there was already a, a kind of a memorial committee being appointed, headed by Anita Contini. And by March 2003, they had uh, invited me and uh, 12 others to become part of a jury for a memorial competition, which would be a, a, a gigantic international competition. The question arose, what comes first? The rebuilding of the towers, <clears throat> uh, the new designs for the World Trade Center site, or the memorial? 
And in a way, the, the proposals for the new buildings uh, seem to build in answers. This particular design uh, by the Think team, Rafael Vignoli and Frederick Schwartz, proposed these skeletal design with office towers only rising up about halfway and the rest kind of being a scaffolding. Um, the design competition for the buildings themselves came down to this design, which uh, the critics loved, but the families hated. The families thought they looked like skeletons full of death. This design happened to include um, articulations of the footprints into empty cubes, even though they weren't asked to memorialize the attacks in any way. Uh, the think team's design included this anyway. And again, you can see that this preoccupation with the, the empty cube, you know, the open cube opening to the sky above was already in the minds of um, architects and designers, even in the rebuilding, even in the redesign of the World Trade Center towers. The other, and eventually the winning design proposed by Daniel Liebeskind, uh, proposed this asymmetrical spire to echo the Statue of Liberty torch, a little too prosaic for many New York critics, <clears throat> um, but the governor liked it and the families loved it because it seemed to tell a, a very New York story for the families. So Governor Pataki uh, summarily uh, chose this, uh, an executive decision, he said, taking the choice out of the hands of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. And construction was to begin. <clears throat> this was chosen in February, 2003. In March, the jury for Memorial was put together. And this would have been the design that we were going to have to work with when we went to define the Memorial process. <clears throat> the Memorial was gonna have to somehow fit within this design, uh, which was, which was very problematic for us. We thought the design was pretty great, but we knew it was going to have to evolve. <clears throat> so this was the Liebeskind design <clears throat> for what the, um, kind of the five acre space that, and how the footprints were to be articulated. So we worked up a uh, memorial mandate with the victims' families, uh, with the city, uh, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. And then we announced in April 2003 an international design competition for um, the World Trade Center site. You can see Maya Lin up in the back row there, Patty Harris, then Deputy Mayor for Mayor Bloomberg. <clears throat> Paula Grant Berry is speaking at the lectern. Uh, the widowed wife of a victim uh, who died in the South Tower. They had three kids. Vartan Gregorian, head of the Carnegie uh, Corporation. Michael Van Valkenburg is in that back row uh, with the glasses and mustache. He happened to be the chair of the jury that chose the Maya Lin design in 1982. Uh, a blind competition like this would be great landscape architect. And within three months, <clears throat> uh, we had received 13,800 registrations. And then by August 1st, the deadline, we had received 5,201 design boards from 62 countries and from every state except for Alaska for some reason. Our decision-making site uh, was a secret uh, to the press, not to us. We had to take all of us come separately, take very circuitous routes to get there. And we were up on the 30th floor of a skyscraper overlooking uh, Ground Zero, <clears throat> now scraped clean. We viewed 200 designs at a time, taking as, as much time as we needed. Uh, taking notes, ruling them out. <clears throat> it would take seven of the 13 um, of us to keep a design in the competition, voting for it. We had a great design uh, a memorial uh, 
uh, management company overseeing this. Um, we each of us got a passion vote to allow a design to go forward just on one vote. Maya Lynn reminded us that her design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial competition uh, was a result of a single juror constantly forwarding her design until it got to a place that everybody could really appreciate what she had proposed. We met with the families three times uh, so they could tell their, their family members lost loved ones stories and our job was just to sit and listen and absorb those stories, absorb their losses, not to be lobbied by them, but just to hear um, not what they wanted, but who and, and why they were commemorating them as they were. We had weekly luncheons with the mayor, Bloomberg, um, who was a big supporter. He was not a big backer of the process uh, beforehand, but really jumped in after and ended up um, heading the Memorial Foundation and making a lead gift of nearly $500 million and then matching, uh, getting matches for a permanent endowment of $1 billion for the Memorial and Museum. This Governor Pataki also met with us once a week <clears throat> just to see how we were doing. At this lunch, um, we asked him um, not to intervene and overrule us. He said, as you had made a summary decision uh, on the, for the building, uh, please tell us that uh, we will be allowed to go forward and even fail in our process. If we can't find a design, we need to be able to fail as well and not be pressured into <clears throat> choosing something that, that we can't support. And, and he agreed. Uh, you can see Maya Lin right there, actually almost at the moment, asking that question. And he agreed to it. That we just couldn't be forced into making a decision from a defensive crouch. It had to be a, a design that we supported and knew how to, uh, to, to write a rationale for. We knew it was a very political process that we were used as props by the governor. Uh, most of us were uh, liberal Democrats. Um, this one of our members had been the deputy governor, uh, Michael McEwen. Uh, the chemistry on the jury was, was great. By November 2003, <clears throat> we had chosen eight finalists without knowing the names uh, of the designers and then uh, invited these eight finalists to come present their designs one at a time to us at Gracie Mansion, the mayor's uh, home on the east side of New York. Uh, by then, Bloomberg had basically given us uh, the mansion over to us. <clears throat> we ate all of our meals there. We met with the eight finalists there. And this was the first time that we met the actual finalists and learned their names. It was a grueling process, getting it down. We gave each other many seminars on uh, landscape, uh, architecture and memorial design. You can see Maya Lin on the left there, Bartan Gregorian. <clears throat> Martin Purrier, great American sculptor, Susan Friedman, the head of the Public Art Fund here. Long dinners, much wine consumed from the mayor's great wine cellar. We ended up with three finalists, <clears throat> this by a French team, proposed planting over the entire five acre site in uh, blossom and fruit bearing blossoming fruit bearing trees, articulating the footprints of the towers in wildflower gardens, and mille fleur, uh, which we loved. <clears throat> um, we loved that this would be completely open. They proposed taking a gardener from uh, one of the 93 nations represented among the victims. This was very much understood to be an international uh, site truly was a World Trade Center site. You know, of the you know, 2,900 or so victims that day, uh, one third were from uh, other countries. But every time uh, 
the architectural team came back to us, they had added several new elements complicating things. And at one point, even wanted to put uh, glass walls around the wildflower gardens, allowing only uh, victims' families to enter, thereby putting them on display in this weird way, like inside of a vitrine, which we, we didn't like. They also put in several levels underneath, uh, which again complicated things uh, too much. And we were already trying to imagine where a museum was going to go. But we loved the idea of the trees changing over the course of the year, the, the pastoral elegiac um, motif uh, we loved, uh, the cycles of life, you know, in, in bloom, you know, blooming, blossoming, in, in full bloom, and then shutting down uh, during the winter. You know, kind of the, the human lifestyle cycle replicated um, every single year. The number two design was this proposal by a German uh, firm called the Memorial Cloud. Um, a stunning design visually, um, but almost so stunning that it kind of took you outside of yourself. We realized that <clears throat> we weren't um, in, allowed to internalize it in any way, that we, we weren't uh, changed inwardly by this but we were just absorbed by the design itself and the way it would have complemented the Santiago Calatrava winged bird of the transit center next door. They would have articulated the footprints in this uh, sod and each of the victims would be remembered um, with its own tube of glass, light coming down, illuminating the victims' names below. And then at night, light illuminating from the names above, creating this glow, this eerie glow which we liked on the one hand, but the only, you know, the only part of a memorial logic that made any sense was that what they called the memorial cloud. And we realized that this would have been referring to the cloud of toxic gas that kind of overhung this entire site for almost six months afterwards, something that none of us wanted to commemorate. And in the end, we also feel that, felt that <clears throat> these, this like lake of glass, uh, frozen lake of glass would be completely inhospitable during the summer and almost as inhospitable during the winter. And so settled on this design, uh, which we like for all kinds of reasons uh, by Michael Arad. Then it was only Michael Arad's design. <clears throat> and here I'm going to go back to the stages of this particular design, in fact. Oh, sorry. You can see this. So you can see the slideshow? Yep, we can see it, James. Thank you. <clears throat> so after we chose the Michael Rod design, Daniel Liebeskin uh, made kind of a quick sketch of what this would look like with his conception of the, um, the new World Trade Center one, what he was still calling uh, Liberty Tower and how the two voids uh, were going to look. And the reasons that we love this you know, so much, <clears throat> in fact, um, had to do with his original uh, kind of weird epiphany he had on his own rooftop uh, in the East Village, looking downtown toward the missing towers. In uh, November, just two months after the attacks in 2001, Michael Arad, a young artist uh, designing actually uh, police um, uh, buildings in Lower Manhattan, um, thought that the towers themselves, the lives lost, would need to be commemorated by two gigantic voids that would be that he proposed putting in the in the river in the New York Harbor at Battery Park. 
So you would have taken the 200 square foot footprints and put them right in the river. <clears throat> and he even created a water table on his rooftop to see what this would look like. And it's pretty stunning. Um, imagine the water falling down the sides. Um, logistically, and from an engineering point of view, we had no idea how he might have pulled this off. Um, but he said this was his original inspiration. And so when the memorial competition was called, he proposed <clears throat> these pools in the footprints of the World Trade Center towers themselves, each one with a further void at the center. Um, he proposed galleries allowing the visitors to go down beneath and to look out through this, these uh, screens of water, these you know, curtains of water um, back up into the sky, scrapers around at World Trade Center One. And we loved this design, but we were also very interventionist, Jerry, with Maya Lynn and Michael Van Valkenburg in particular making uh, suggestions, including um, doing something to improve the open plaza. Um, so that basically what you've done in the memorial, we love this idea and we love its minimalist design, we love the voids, but we need life in the plaza. <clears throat> and, and you've replicated one of the most inhospitable features of the super blocks uh, uh, of the World Trade Center towers themselves, uh, which were really uh, windswept <clears throat> and very kind of um, in, inhumane. Uh, sites, uh, which is why, why the towers were you know, relatively unloved at first. So the architect uh, came back with these trees, which we liked very much. He said Michael Van Valkenburg uh, wanted more and asked Michael Rod to go find a landscape architect, which he did. Peter Walker, uh, probably America's greatest landscape architect also a minimalist architect who has lots of work in Japan. Peter Walker uh, proposed this abacus grid of white swamp oak trees uh, filling the plaza with life. The taller the trees would become, the deeper the volumes of the voids would become. You would now be balancing uh, life with life and, and loss with loss, regeneration. Uh, on the one hand, and as a compensation, uh, but always commemorating the loss and each loss further punctuated by the, the, the further voids at their centers. <clears throat> and we love this. Uh, one of the features we liked best was this notion of the abacus grid, so that when you look uh, from east to west, from left to right, or right to left, you see the nice, neat rows of trees uh, echoing the city grid. But when you look from north to south or south to north, you see these random groves of trees so that you've got the randomness of nature on the one hand and then the city grid at the same time, which we thought was quite brilliant. And so we eventually voted for this. Um, it was very easy to write a rationale for it. Uh, Michael Rod and Peter Walker uh, had a great rationale for the ways that uh, the towers would thereby be remembered by their articulated footprints. Uh, <clears throat> life would be commemorated um, and remembered by the falling of water. The fallingness of the towers uh, would also be echoed uh, in the falling of water. The voids would never be filled in completely. And here you see uh, the eventual design for both the pools and then the museum atrium here. <clears throat> The atrium design, um, by the way, is by Snoheta, uh, the great architectural firm uh, from Norway. So we announced this design in January 2004. The trees were planted in New Jersey <clears throat> uh, like that spring. And then over the course of the next years, brought in, planted here. And here we are on the ninth anniversary of the attacks, once again, the reflecting ponds at the right of bedrock were, were filled with first water, then flowers. And then on the 10th anniversary itself, President Obama came to read a psalm, the family members came, 
and we walked through for the very first time explaining to uh, members of the administration, the mayor's office, and the family members uh, what and why we had chosen this particular design. The names were uh, a real, and their placement were a real stroke of genius by the architect, Michael Arad. You'll remember that Maya Lin uh, arranged her names uh, to kind of re be embedded in history and not alphabetically. Michael Arad proposed um, moving the names from below ground to the parapets uh, here, but to arrange them in what he called meaningful adjacencies. That is, <clears throat> every family would be asked who they would want their loved one's name to be by. And an algorithm was created in the architectural firm. And thereby, every single name is surrounded by the names that their family members wanted them to be by. Um, that, that means, of course, that many of the flight attendants are together, many of the firefighters are, are together, <clears throat> families are together, friends are together. And that the first responders would be remembered as first responders, not by being clustered in one place, but by having uh, uh, precinct numbers of police officers <clears throat> and ladder company numbers of uh, the firefighters uh, emblazoned next to their names, just so that they are marked, not to create a hierarchy, but to make very clear the difference between those who died, um, both civic deaths and you know, personal private family deaths. So this arc has now led um, for uh, really interesting reasons. Um, I haven't really done this before, but I did call up a few images uh, from what I think is America's greatest new memorial, uh, the National Memorial uh, for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama which uh, is designed <clears throat> by a Massachusetts firm called Mass Design, but inspired very much by Brian Stevenson, the head of the Equal Justice Initiative. Brian Stevenson talks about the ways that he was inspired by the Denk Ball. Let's see if we can get these up here. Brian Stevenson um, visited the Denk Mall in, in Berlin. Let's see. There we go. And was struck uh, by uh, kind of the human proportions of the uh, Stelle, uh, the sheer number of the Stelle, 2,711, and proposed here taking Stelle like this, but instead of anchoring them in the ground to commemorate the victims of lynchings, <clears throat> some 803 lynching victims. Um, per uh, arranged by counties. Um, he, sorry, hang, to interrupt, we can't see that in full screen. We can still just see the folder. Oh, so you don't see this? Not in full screen. Okay, let's see. Sorry. That's okay. Mm hmm. Um. It's your screen sharing. We can just see the thumbnails. You see, just see the thumbnail. Just not sure. Then, uh... 
because you can. Yeah, perfect. You have that now. Yep, we can see it. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> um, thinking of uh, the gravity that actually um, caused the deaths of lynching victims, not to mention obviously the uh, <clears throat> the white terrorists who did these lynchings. And thinking of the gravity pulling down the towers and pulling down the water, he uh, decided to mount the stele in the ceilings. And we eventually would walk uh, underneath them with the county's names on top. Each of these stele has a duplicate in a large pile outside of this memorial, waiting to be claimed by every single county where these lynchings took place. If you visit this memorial and you see that that individual stele is still there, and these are Corten steel, if, they, if that is still there <clears throat> with the county's name on it, with these victims' names on it, it means that the county has not claimed its victims. And so each of these counties is now basically challenged to take home this monument and plant it at the site of the lynching itself. This is meant to be that mobile mar you know, memorial, the one that moves back out into the counties, <clears throat> even as all of these still remain hanging here. It's extremely powerful um, and is very much, again, um, obviously indebted to the forms of other memorials and, and the kind of the book motifs and conceptual underpinnings of these other memorials. And I think that uh, we need to talk about um, this arc of memorial vernacular leading all the way to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, <clears throat> uh, otherwise known, also known as the, the Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. So with that, I'm glad to invite questions. I mean, it's put a lot of stuff out there, <laughs> but um, this, this notion of the counter monument, you know, challenging conventional monuments and enlivening memory as opposed to um, ossifying it and fossilizing it, I think is at the heart of, of the contemporary memorials um, I've tried to discuss here. Thank you so much, James. You've given us so much to think about. Um, we can see a few questions as well. While we're on the image and subject of the lynching memorial, I was wondering if, first of all, we've got a question if many of them have been claimed by the counties. And second, I was wondering if you could just say a few words about the current uh, Black Lives Matter movement and our interaction with memorials of controversial or racist figures. <clears throat> and how those memorials are now being either taken down or uh, vandalized and they're being really kind of, you know, you were talking about memory and memorials as a um, something that should cause us to act. And I think really that's what's happening, revisiting these old memorials. Um, so if you could just say a few words about that, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts. Well, I think that, <clears throat> um, so Brian Stevens, this has framed this National Memorial for Peace and Justice very much in terms of restorative justice um, and part of his uh, equal justice initiative. <clears throat> so that memory is always connected to um, uh, trying to accomplish justice, leading toward justice, you know, bending toward justice somehow. And <clears throat> he's created um, a, a space here which demands actions by the counties where these lynchings took place. Um, only one county right now, I, I think actually more than one now, but the first county uh, to actively um, uh, figure out a protocol for bringing you know, its, its column home is Jefferson County, <clears throat> Birmingham, uh, Alabama. And they've created something called the um, Jefferson County Memorial Project in which they've actually hired landscape architects uh, who have found the places they need to near the town square, I think between the town hall and their, um, their, their county justice building, where they're going to place theirs, but they're still trying to find the protocol. You, is it going to be like a, a funeral procession, you know, from Montgomery, you know, to Birmingham? 
it, it could well be. Um, it will be installed. There'll be a way in which it will be owned and claimed, you know, by the county, thereby restoring, um, at, at a minimal, at the most minimal way, not justice, but but reclaiming and restoring the memory of these lynchings to the town's history. <clears throat> and there was a way in which the all the Confederate monuments were um, taking the space. Um, and creating, you know, this this narrative of the uh, so-called lost cause um, in the place of the memory of the victims of terror, racial terror in this country, and so both this and the sites of Confederate monuments, which are which are coming down, uh, when they come down, they're meant to open space up for the memory of the victims of con Confederate white supremacist you know, ideology, uh, on the one hand. But they're also creating um, uh, the places where these monuments uh, might now be projected onto. And there's even, uh, there's several artists, in fact, one artist in particular, who's now projecting Black Lives Matters uh, protests and, and emblems onto Confederate monuments in kind of a guerrilla fashion, you know, and taking photographs. And they're quite beautiful. So again, these are things that, you know, this projection of photographs, something that Shimon Ati did, of course it's going to be done you know now in now in this context and it is a reckoning uh america has never had a racial reckoning it has never had to ne never made itself uh, uh come face to face with how this country was built and when you know the 1619 project is the beginning and so th these these are all part of that that conversation and there really has now been the beginning of a reckoning. I mean, we're nowhere near yeah, the end of this, but it has now begun. And I think there is a way in which it was Germany that broke, broke the wood on this and broke the models. Maya Lin you know, broke the very first memorial model. How do we remember, remember something that America really wanted to forget and which you know, a war that Americans abhorred? How to remember the uh, American soldiers who fell in a war that America no longer supported. And that did give uh, the Germans kind of a, a, an opening into how to approach remembering, you know, the, the national <clears throat> mass murder of a people in the German name, which in turn has, I think, returned to American shores and inspired Americans to begin remembering the, um, the origins of our, our, our national sin. If you, if you will. Thank you. And yeah, I mean, we can um, see a lot of the parallels, I think, between what was happening in Germany um, with regards to these kind of county memorials. Uh, England, obviously, Britain also has a lot of work to do in that sense. Um, speaking of the German memorials, we've had a few questions about the, um, the, uh, the memorial in Berlin and visitor interaction. Um, obviously, we have the Holocaust project and there's a lot of debates around how people are interacting with it is part of the cityscape mm -hmm. um, in some ways problematic, in some ways, you know, it's kind of what was intended, right? So I was wondering if you could say a few words, having had so much intervention in that memorial, how it feels to see how it's being interacted with today. So uh, so which one, the, the Dekmal or? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, I mean, the, the Denkmal was never uh, completely popular among, uh, I say probably half the population, half the population of Germans. And part of introducing it was also introducing the notion that uh, these memorials don't always get built out of a consensus. Uh, they can also be built out of disagreement and in consensus um, in some ways. Um, most of the visitors to the memorial, I'd say, are from outside of Berlin and are probably foreigners. Uh, it ends up becoming very much um, a part of the touristic consumption of memorial sites all over you know, Berlin, but it's central. It's, it's built from you know, right, right in the center uh, of Berlin. So its, it's placement has now become kind of both central to um, 
kind of Berlin's you know, tourist trails, but also I think central in some ways to um, German um, policy, including refugee policy and including the, uh, their policies and in intervention in, in current, um, yeah, current potential genocides. Um, Merkel, Angela, Angela Merkel was very clear that she was basing her decision to take in 1.5 million Syrian refugees on the memory of Germany's past and citing you know, the Holocaust as part of that foundation of the German past, which now must be reckoned with and which must now inform policy making. And she did it quite openly, just as Joschka Fischer did you know, in the intervention in 1999 you know, against the Serbs. Um, I know, I mean, it's getting picked up in social media in all kinds of ways, you know, the Yolo cost, uh, you know, controversy, if that's what it is, it's not really a controversy, but, but I mean, social media is going to do with these memorials, um, things that, um, other, other media, you know, can't do or won't do. And they're going to find, you know, new lives in all these new kinds of platforms that we're just going to have to live with and, and deal with as critically as we can. Yeah, but, well, not, you know, uh, uh, negating them or canceling them out in any way. I'd be curious to know, I mean, <clears throat> what, you know, some of the listeners and, and viewers here um, think about the memorial itself and think about some of the controversies um, that, you know, Germany's discussion may have engendered uh, in, in the UK's own discussion, you know, of its monuments, because I, I know that there's also a, a huge, you know, kind of, Memorial Revolution now in the UK as well. Thank you. Um, so we'll just try and get through some more questions, if that's okay. Um, so Holly said, I visited the 9-11 Memorial and Museum last year. Um, and she was overwhelmed by the amount of uh, memorabilia in the museum. And was that part, that aspect of the museum, which really does overwhelm you with with these kind of objects and photographs it's in a small yeah. space, I would say. Um, so she asked, was the museum of it envisioned as a deliberate counterpoint to the voids and absence of the memorial pools outside? Was that kind of a, you know, a deliberate intention? Um, I don't think it was a deliberate counterpoint, but there was very much <clears throat> the impulse in the museum uh, not to leave anything out, which creates, uh, um, you know, as she saw, uh, almost an overwhelming uh, number of uh, stories, uh, artifacts, memorabilia. The story of the day, you know, told through the eyes of, um, you know, 30 or 40 nations, told through the eyes of hundreds and hundreds of the uh, victims and their families. Uh, every victim uh, has a, a narrative attached, you know, created by the family. It, it is probably too much. Um, I think knowing that you can always subtract a little bit and simplify a little bit over time uh, probably uh, underpins, you know, the, the kind of the overstuffedness you know, of the museum now. I think it's very effective. It's very demanding. It takes a lot of time to go through. I think um, after the fact, uh, it is it's probably appropriate to see the, the the sheer number of artifacts of the memorabilia counterpointing the voids above. You might say even filling the voids above, you know, conceptually, filling the voids with the stories of the of those lost. So that it does work in that way, and and also a bit of a yin and yang fashion. Um, but uh, some have critiqued the museum as being too full. Um, and I think that it might be it might be a fair critique, um, knowing that you can begin to uh, streamline and, and take away over time, or at least you know replace some of the exhibitions you know with new contemporary uh, stories and reasons for remembering. Thank you. And we have another question here. Do memorials have an obligation to be educational? Many seem to be more about aesthetics and allowing for distance and contemplacency. Yeah, I would say all of the above, <clears throat> that they uh, memorials become kind of crossroads for aesthetics, politics, uh, communal grieving, 
um, uh, points, uh, spaces for education. Uh, some are very aggressively educational. They're, they're, they exist only to educate and to tell a very particular story, a very particular version of history. Um, it's when kind of the educational mission becomes very hard and fast that I think the memorial begins to lose uh, some of its life. And so there's um, the contemporary artists and architects are very aware um, that these spaces need to be um, inviting over time and need to accommodate every new generation's reasons for coming to them. And I think that's a little bit of the reason for the more minimalist uh, approach and less figurative approach and less over-determined approach that the many are taking. Um, you know, even in the, you know, memorial, like, uh, you know, the, the, the footprints, uh, the, the pools at Ground Zero, it's just the names and, and the trees and the design and that combination, um, you know, is meant, you know, by the architects just to force us to think about regenerating life in the city, remembering the dead and the lost, you know, by these forms of loss and to have a way to do it communally so that you can do this um, separately and together. And you kind of do it also um, by walking from one place to the, to the next. There are small additions to the memorial um, downtown now, which includes the Memorial Glade uh, to remember uh, those who died after uh, cleaning up um, you know, Ground Zero. Um, I think that uh, Steel Cross is going to be reintroduced uh, to the perimeter um, of the of Ground Zero. Um, it's going to evolve uh, over time. It's the grid of the city is re completely restored down there. It very much is a, a part of the fabric of the city, um, again, which is part of the point. Um, if a memorial tries to do too much, I think it can be paralyzed by clutter. <laughs> And so there's just always this balance of the city trying to use the museum space to um, tell very specific stories and the space above as a place for meditation and contemplation. Um, the sound of the, of the fall uh, of the falling water actually can create an intimate space where the city sounds are kind of blotted out and only the voices of people right next to you, you know, can be heard. So th these are all you know, aspects of the memorial down there, some of which work better than others. Thank you. Um, we've got another question from Holly. Um, do you see the role for memory or memorialization at this stage in how COVID is unfolding? Um, and she's particularly um, pointing out the case that there's already been 200,000 deaths over in the US. Um, but of course, as it develops more, that that's going to rise across the world. So how do you think perhaps we would go about memorializing the pandemic and in what way? Well, in uh, the front page of the New York Times this morning <clears throat> was a photograph of a front yard in Austin, Texas, where <clears throat> the owner uh, has ch a child with, who is immunocompromised. And so um, with the very first uh, uh, deaths in Texas decided uh, he would plant a little flag, um, a little kind of pennant in his front yard. <clears throat> and now, of course, he's up to uh, several thousand, I think there are 15,000 flags now planted in his front yard, which is ongoing. So it raises the question how to commemorate um, an ongoing catastrophe. Um, especially in a time where the catastrophe itself actually takes away the ability to um, commemorate traditionally. Um, no funerals, no memorial settings, uh, no readings, no gatherings are allowed. So in a weird way, the, uh, this is a, um, a virus which takes away both the people and the, and the conventional capacity to commemorate them and which defers memory and defers commemoration. And in deferring commemoration, <laughs> this terrible virus pandemic um, also allows um, more meaning to accumulate. And in that meaning, uh, part of that meaning will certainly be political meaning. 
And so both the victims will be commemorated and the incompetence in leadership at the very top of the government will also be now commemorated. So there will be memorials which both commemorate loss and if you will, the, um, the, the circumstances which aggravated this loss. And um, the longer I think the space of time is between loss which can't be commemorated until things have passed over a little bit and the moment of commemoration, the more time there will be for, I think what will end up being political re recrimination. And um, this isn't the first time that you know, such a process kind of paralyzed itself. After uh, Hurricane Katrina, there was uh, a, a rush to memorialize, but it kept getting bogged down in, in um, how to commemorate both the victims of the hurricane on the one hand and to commemorate the uh, incompetence of um, engineers and the government in their response on the other, that they wanted to do both. And in trying to do both, often uh, nobody was commemorated. Um, I think we've got more time now, and that um, this is, this pandemic is so clear um, that it is the result of a huge mishandling and incompetence and mismanagement on the government's part, that that will be part of what gets commemorated no matter what. And uh, the, the, the memorial maker in Austin, Texas, uh, admits to becoming angrier and angrier by the day. Yeah. Um, at the at the mismanagement, <clears throat> and that he sees these people as being both victims of the virus and victims of of um, the Trump administration's uh, incompetence. Thank you. And um, so, a next question: um, How have you seen jurors, etc., navigate the relationships among architect artist identity? subjects and flows of capital happening behind the scenes of these projects. Um, thinking of the blind jury stages versus the guerrilla engagements of the populace with existing monuments. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. It's kind of the question I would have had before um, being part of these, <laughs> these juries. Um, a lot depends on the composition of the jury. <clears throat> in the case of the National September 11 Memorial uh, jury, it was composed of uh, architects like Maya Lin and Michael Van Valkenburg <clears throat> and Enrique Norton, uh, who were very used to doing big projects and understanding that building, building things, whether memorials or buildings, um, involves huge amounts of capital and raising money and uh, political uh, maneuvering to get these things done. And um, th then there were people like Susan Friedman from the Public Art Fund, uh, whose job has been to fund uh, public art projects, uh, knowing that that's also the result of lots of fundraising on the one hand, and then um, becoming the arbiters of aesthetics in the city. You know, what gets built and what doesn't get built um, happens through the Public Art Fund. Uh, Lowry Simmons was the head of the Harlem Studio Museum, uh, was on our jury, uh, brought both a great eye, but also an institutional understanding for uh, how these things get built or don't get built. <clears throat> and so I guess part of, uh, um, and I was one of, I don't know, I guess Vartan Grigorian and I were you know, the two academics, kind of historians, uh, cultural historians, who understood that part of uh, public building is always going to be both politics and finance and that um, the stories that we tell of these um, processes have to include all of these elements. Um, navigating all those together uh, isn't always easy, um, but I guess when the jurors understand by having participated in these things before or having even designed these things before, as, as Maya Lin did, you know, even as a senior at Yale University when she proposed her design, um, she was a quick, you know, and, and pretty tough education. Um, you know, the kind of the buzzsaw she ran into, um, opposition, people questioning her, but she stuck to it and she built exactly, you know, um, what she designed, you know, in Washington, D.C. And, and got it done. 
So these are all different streams that we have to navigate and all these processes. <clears throat> I suppose by having only five jurors in the, on the Findus Commission in Berlin, uh, this was streamlined a little bit. Um, politics uh, were probably the, uh, the most difficult, you know, shoals to navigate here. Uh, money, you know, was less so. I mean, in the end, ironically, uh, I mean, the Germans usually overbuild things. And if anything, in the case of the, of the Dinkma, they may have underbuilt it a little bit. Uh, they did save a little bit of money instead of having uh, the eight thick walls of the Stella, they ended up being four inches. And one of the results is they've been cracking and having to be replaced. Um, but they're, they're taking care of that, you know, as they go along. Um, but these are all parts of the life of the monument, and they become emblematic in some ways, but they can't, they don't skew in any particular, in any one direction um, over time. I think all of these are, are elements of the memorial process. Thank you. Um, just one final question then, I think, while we've got time. Um, and this is something I was thinking about as well. So in thinking um, in terms of the timing of memorializing an event. Um, so this, the question is worded as, I was struck by your comment that days after the 9-11, days after 9-11, they asked you about um, what mem the memorial should look like and when that should be built and how that could come about. So do you think it could be too soon? When do you think maybe we should look to memorialize events? Was that a concern for you? I don't, I don't think there's a single prescription that fits all, but certainly being asked within days of the attacks what the memorial is going to be is way, way too soon. And my answer was that it's, it's not memory yet. It's, it's unfolding history. And we don't know what it means. We don't know if this is the beginning of a 30-year so-called war on terror. We don't know if there are going to be other terror attacks following, which would be linked to these attacks. We don't know. The only, the only people who actually have a grasp of the meaning of these attacks are families who lost loved ones. So it's direct personal loss of loved ones for them. Um, but beyond that, we don't know what the meanings are. But of course, this is very hard for politicians who really want to not just have concrete meaning, but they want it immediately. We can, they, they, uh, they're very uncomfortable, um, you know, with kind of uh, moving and arbitrary uh, unfolding, you know, meanings that they can't nail down. And they wanted to be in a position to nail it down. This is what it means, and this is what it will mean for all time. But as I said, that <clears throat> um, that's not actually how memorials work. And if you nail it down or nail a meaning down on the first day, it's going to be completely obsolete after a year. And that um, you want to step back and see the memorial in its long durée. It's you know it's kind of prehistory, the history of its coming into being, its reception in real time, and possibly even its eventual destruction. Um, uh, the histories of these memorials often will and must include their endpoints as well, and their eventual disappearance. They have to be able to recognize that even what they purport to be, you know, saying about history now will change over time. I've been asked if the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, what what is it going to be commemorating in 50 years? And I said, I don't know, but it will not be commemorating only what it's commemorating now. But I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be very different from what it is now. And I think that's the same for the 9-11 Memorial, and I think for the Deck Mall as well. You know, the Deck Mall has now become a one node in a matrix uh, of memory to the victims of the uh, euthanasia program. Uh, there's now the, the homosexual monument to, you know, nearby, which is actually one of the stele, seems to be one of the stele in which they put a video box. There's the memorial in the Tiergarten, you know, five minute walk away of the, uh, to the Sinti and Roma, to the gypsies. Um, and when people in Berlin were saying, well, you can't allow this memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe to take the place of all these other, you know, victim groups. He said, You're, it's not. It's just going to become one node among many, many others. And you have to be open to allowing all these other memorials to, you know, to end up constituting a matrix of, of composite memory. 
Um, but a lot of this is in approaching the memorials in that way and not asking of them a single answer or a single memory you know, to very complicated historical events. Thank you so much, James. Really, that's, I think, a great point to end on is that we have these patterns of commemoration and memory and we're seeing a lot of it being repeated as well, which is just extremely interesting and really, yeah, you've given us a lot to think about. So with that, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it's been amazing lecture um, and thank you so much for giving us the time on behalf of the British Association of Holocaust Studies. We are very grateful. Um, so we will post a link to our website where this talk's being recorded and we'll put that up um, within the next couple of weeks. So with that I'd just like to say a huge thank you again. Okay thanks for having me and um, great questions and, <clears throat> and I know it's pretty exhausting a lot lot to absorb but, but uh, thanks for opening the space for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Hope to be in touch soon. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone.